Welcome to NAC TV Reads the News. My name is Gwen Jacobson and I'm one of many volunteers that help create programming for our station. NAC TV can be seen on MTS Channel 30 and 1030, West Bank Cable Channel 17, Bell Satellite Channel 592, or online at nactv.tv. These programs are made possible by our volunteers, staff, advertisers, as well as donations made by you, the viewers. If you are enjoying your NAC TV experience, please consider supporting us by either donation or volunteering. You can contact our office at 204-476-2639 or at nactv at wcgwave.ca. This week's edition of the Nipah Banner and Press is dated Friday, June 16th, 2023. On the front page, we have a picture of a brand new play structure by Casper Werhan. Rainy weather brought celebrations indoors at the Nipah Middle School, or NMS, on June the 8th. The NMS was host to students and their families as well as sponsors that day to celebrate the grand opening of the school's playground. While the playground has been in use for some time now, the final piece, known as the Meteor, was recently installed. NMS principal Val Perieski provided an opening speech to kick off the event, stating, We are so pleased to have so many of our wonderful guests here today. Thank you to all of you and to our donors and sponsors. After the opening comments, all present were welcome to enjoy conversation and a hot dog lunch. Live music was also provided by the NMS Jazz Band. This, the project was approximately one year in the making and since it was first officially declared ready for use, it has provided students with plenty of fun. That fun has reportedly been elevated with the final edition. One student, Chris Jared Basco walked the Nipua banner and press through a detailed explanation of the structure. In addition to the slides and several stationary pieces, there are also pieces that move and spin. I feel like an astronaut, said Basco of one of the spinners. Basco added, there's another piece that we call the spider web. There's a, a couple poles and the web is made up of a bunch of ropes and there's a ring in it. So it's modeled after one of those real spider webs you can find. Fellow student Baxton Husak also weighed in stating, it's amazing, I've been having a lot of fun with it. With such a diverse structure, students and the community are sure to be entertained with each visit. All right, um, ooh, high life. High Life Foods announces 87 layoffs, including 29 positions at Nipua by Owen Devereaux. Seismic shifts in the global pork market are unfortunately hitting close to home. On Friday, June the 9th, High Life Foods announced it must lay off, it must lay off 87 employees, including 29 positions at the pork processing facility in Nipua. The majority of affected jobs are related to administrative and are not expected to significantly impact production. In a media release confirming the staff downsizing, High Life noted that there were several factors connected to the decision, including inflation, rising pro production costs, and a growing uncertainty in pork markets. Concerns over the fluctuating exchange rates in foreign markets were also cited. Grant Lazarek, President and Chief Executive Officer of High Life, stated that despite their best efforts, this is something that had to be done. He said over the last several months, these difficulties have become increasingly pressing and have created a situation where we need to be more efficient. We are carefully restructuring to endure the current global conditions. These are roles and people we value. No decision has been easy. We want to sincerely thank the team members who are departing, but we know that long-term 
these incredibly hard choices will reposition and return our business to a place of strength and stability. Over the last few weeks, High Life Foods has been restructuring its global operations, including the announced closure of its pork facility in Wyndham, Minnesota, directly impacting 1,000 jobs. Premium Iowa Pork, a U.S.-based pork company, is reportedly set to buy that facility, according to a recent article from Minneapolis-based newspaper, The Star Tribune. High Life Food is headquartered in La Brokery, Manitoba, and has facilities and barns across the province in locations such as La Brokery, Steinbach, Nipua, and Killarney. Globally, it also had facilities located in the United States and Mexico. Hmm. Nipua making inroads in their roads by Owen Devereaux. By the arrival of winter, some Nipua's roads will be looking a little bit better. On Tuesday, June 6th, Town Council has approved the go-ahead on a few notable street repair and upgrades. First, Council agreed to a contract with Profile Paving Limited, who are based out of Brandon. Profile has been hired to look after the asphalt patching at several various locations throughout the town at a cost of $86,389 plus GST. Patching is the process of filling potholes or excavated areas in the existing asphalt pavement. This type of preemptive repair work helps control further deterioration and expensive repair of the pavement. As well, Council, on the advice of Town Administration, agreed to go ahead with the hiring. Zenith Paving Limited to proceed with full-scale paving projects on three roads. Those projects are the installation or removal of asphalt on a portion of Stonehouse Street, Mountain Avenue, from Ada to First Street, and First Avenue to the South Limited. These road repairs have been approved at an estimated cost of $234,490 plus GST. An exact start date for any of this road repairs to begin was not discussed at the council meeting, though it is hoped that the contracted companies will be able to proceed as soon as possible. Helen Drysdale, out of Helen's Kitchen. This week, her article is entitled Town Names. This should be interesting. As the prairies of Canada were settled, immigrants came by the thousands, putting down roots and naming their little corners of the world. Some places were named after where the settlers moved from, and many place names came from the landscape, lakes, and rivers. Still, more are named for families in the community or honor political or historical figures. And then there are those with origin stories that even locals can't agree on. I decided to, to delve into some of our local towns and villages names. So here it goes. Nipua's name came from an Ojibwe word meaning plenty of. The area had plenty of free land for homesteading and it was found to have plenty of rich agricultural soil, perfect for growing bountiful crops. Bernie's name came from one of the first settlers in that area named John Bernie, who arrived in 1886. His land was where the town was built. There are still Bernies in the area today. The name story for the town of Eden says that in 1877, Mrs. McCracken, the oldest person living in town, got the honor of giving the new town its name. With the bountiful crops and gardens that the area grew, she felt like she was living in the Garden of Eden. I like that or origin story. Brookdale's name came from John Mitchell, the first postmaster who named the post office Brookdale for the little brook running in the vicinity. When the school was built in 1883, it took the name of the post office as did the town when it was formed in 1902. 
and there are still Mitchells living there too. Franklin was known as Bridge Creek until 1890. Residents wanted the name changed to Franklin. The origins of that name story are not clear, one believing it was named after Benjamin Franklin and another after the explorer, Sir John Franklin. Hmm. To the north of Franklin is the community of Polonia. Its original name was Huns Valley, named after the, uh, the settlement of Hungarian people who came in 1885. In 1921, the name changed to Polonia to represent the large number of Polish people that had settled in that area. If you have ever taken the 357 road that goes past the village of Mountain Road, the name is just that simple. You have to drive up a mountain road. <laughs> Arden has several stories of how it was named. One story goes that Maurice Boughton, the first postmaster who opened the first general store, named it after a town that he lived near in England. Another story is that it was named after a cook on the railway construction crew named Arden. He was said to disappear for naps and the construction foreman was always saying, where is Arden? That story probably, that story probably is a beer committee tale, but who knows? Wellwood was named after the Reverend James Wellwood, who came in the 1880s to serve as a Presbyterian minister to a large area. He lived in Tanner's Crossing, later called Minnedosa, and traveled to serve his congregation. He was appointed school inspector and was instrumental in building a school at Wellwood. The story of the Mentmore name is my favorite. The village was on the land owned by Thomas Drayson, who had immigrated from England. He believed that his new home meant more <laughs> to him than his old home. I purchased an older cookbook recently and it had pages of another cookbook in it. There is no cover, so I have no idea which ladies group published it. I did enjoy the older family names who contributed the, the recipes. Today, you will find several of the recipes from that partial book just the way they were written. Perhaps you will recognize the names from the past. Enjoy. The first one is a cauliflower carrot coleslaw recipe by Mrs. Agnes Willerton. The next is a chocolate brownies recipe by Mrs. Albert Jury of Eden. And I know jury, there's still lots of juries in Eden. And the last one is a chicken rice casserole by Lorraine Tanner. All right, here's a article about Nipua raising the roof for new health care by Owen Devereaux. Nipua's 45 foot height restriction for most new buildings is just not enough for the massive medical undertaking being planned for our community's east end. On Tuesday, June 6th, Bird Construction, on behalf of Prairie Mountain Health, asked for a variance to the local bylaw in order to accommodate the planned $127 million health care facility. Taller ceilings are needed for modern hospitals for their medical equipment and duct work and the existing local restrictions would make that difficult. Council reviewed and approved the variance unanimously. The brand new hospital in Nipua was first announced back in 2021, with the province optimistic that construction could be fully completed by 2025. Other notes, other items of note. Council has approved the creation of design drawings for a pair of railway crossing within the town's jurisdiction. If a community is considering any type of permanent modifications near a, an existing P Canadian Pacific Rail crossing, they are required to have technical design created and sent to the company for review and approval. In relation to that, Nipua is looking into changes to the approach 
angles at crossing at Hurl Road and Barker Road. Council has hired Burns Mendel Consulting Engineers Limited to create the required designs at a cost of $16,450 plus taxes. The permanent closure of a portion of Commerce Street has been approved. The section being altered was just east of Mountain Avenue and was previously used as the pathway into the Yellowhead Centre parking lot and NACI track and field football complex. That part of the street was already sectioned off last year. This final approval simply makes it official, allowing for its removal from uh, future maps. And lastly, approval has been given for the proposed parade route for the Filipino Heritage Parade on Saturday, June 17th. The parade will begin at 1 p.m. at Riverbend and travel to the Yellowhead Centre. Portions of the street will be blocked off for a time during the festivities. Now, Rural Outlook section. Over $36,000 raised for Carberry Splash Park Committee by Casper Werhon. The Nipua Banner and Press received a welcome update last week regarding Carberry's Kalina Green Memorial event. The event was held on May 27th in honour of Green's life and adventurous spirit, as well as to celebrate her birthday. As part of this celebration, a fundraiser walk slash run was held in which all funds raised would be donated to the Carberry Splash Park Committee. The numbers from this fundraiser have been confirmed and they sing to the tune of six figures. Precisely a grand total of $36,712 was raised in Green's honour as of June the 3rd. Additionally, further donations are still being received. Attendance for the event also boasted a, a healthy number with an official participation count of over 500 people. Green had a great love for swimming and it is anticipated that the Splash Park will be a positive addition to the community once the committee reaches their goal and can bring the project to fruition. We have a couple of pictures from the event. Here we have participants making their way out from under this balloon arch at the fundraiser celebrating Kalina Green's life and birthday on May 27th. The event was held at Carberry's R.J. Wow Elementary School. And here we have a volunteer whipping up some delicious grub on a barbecue for all in attendance when they were done their walk. Next is about a new AIS inspection stations established in Minidosa and St. Rose de Lac submitted by the Manitoba government. Boaters in Western Manitoba will see new aquatic invasive species, also known as AIS, inspection stations near Minidosa and St. Rose de Lac. Natural Resources and Northern Development Minister Greg Nesbitt announced the new stations on Friday, June 9th. Watercraft inspection stations are a critical tool in controlling the spread of aquatic invasive species and these new stations have been placed specifically to respond to growing zebra mussel and other AIS threats in western Manitoba. Cleaning, draining and drying your boat is a responsible practice every boater must follow to protect our ecosystems and maintain recreational opportunities. So we need all Manitobans to do their part to help control the spread of AIS. Watercraft inspection stations help watercraft users comply with AIS requirements. Anyone transporting motorized or non-motorized watercraft such as canoes and kayaks must stop at all open watercraft inspection stations along their route. The Manitoba government is also advising of new AIS control measures at Footprint Lake, located north of Grand Rapids between Cedar Lake and Lake Winnipeg. Anyone using watercraft and water-related equipment in Footprint Lake and its tributaries must ensure to clean, drain, 
dry and de decontaminate all watercraft and water related equipment before placing them onto another water body. Signage will be placed at access points to Footprint Lake to reflect this new measure. All watercraft users in Manitoba are reminded to remain vigilant and do their part to protect the province's water bodies from the introduction and spread of AIS, the minister noted. This includes ensuring all watercraft and water-related equipment are clean, drained and dry after use in any water body in Manitoba and decontaminated after using these items in a water body designated as a control zone. Set fines for AIS offenses, offenses are in effect year-round and carry a range of penalties depending on the offense, including a $672 fine for failing to stop at a watercraft inspection site and a $2,542 fine for removing watercraft or water-related equipment from a water body in a control zone and placing it into another water body without proper decontamination. Ooh, those are hefty fines. All right, a uh, suspect arrested in Erickson home invasion by Owen Devereaux. An arrest has been made in connection to a shocking home invasion and assault in a close-knit rural community. The incident, according to the RCMP investigation, is believed to have taken place just before 2 a.m. on Tuesday, June the 6th. The accused, an 18-year-old male, is believed to have entered the home of the victim, a 30-year-old woman. Once inside the home, the assailant stabbed the woman multiple times, causing significant injuries. RCMP say the suspect, who wasn't previously known to the victim, fled the scene after the incident. The victim, who has been identified as Candace Richardson, was rushed to hospital in Erickson and later transferred to Winnipeg, where she remains in stable condition. Manitoba RCMP confirmed via media release that the 18-year-old suspect, Carter Prince, was arrested on Wednesday, June 7th and remains in custody. Prince has been charged with attempted murder, break and enter to commit an indictable offence and possession of a prohibited weapon. As details emerged later uh, related to the attack, the community of Erickson banded together to offer support. A relative of Richardson has put together an online GoFundMe account help cover uh, any medical costs that are not covered by provincial health care. As of Wednesday, June 14th, that account had eclipsed its $20,000 goal by almost $13,000. The GoFundMe details can be found at www.gofundme.com slash f slash Candace hyphen Richardson. Um, now we have, oh, this is going back to the ceremony that was held for the play structure at Nipua Middle School. Here we have a picture of parents, students, and play structure sponsors, sponsors gathered in the Nipua Middle School last week to celebrate the grand opening of the now fully complete uh, playground implement. All in attendance were treated to a hot dog lunch, as well as music provided by the Nipua Middle School Jazz. Due to rainy conditions, the ceremony shifted inside the school, and here's the band playing. <laughs> Very nice. All right, Cenovus uh, Energy Invests in Community Safety by Casper Wehrhahn. Big news broke out at Minidosa last week. On June 9th, officials from the town, local fire department and Cenovus Energy congregated at the Minidosa Fire Training Station to announce a donation 
a donation of $155,000. This donation is contributed by Cenevis to the Minidosa Fire Department and is expected to significantly bolster its capabilities. This funding includes $100,000 towards the purchase of a new fire truck and $55,000 to support Minidosa's new fire training grounds. With this announcement, Cenevis has now donated a total of $75,000 to the training grounds as a donation of $20,000 uh, was made in 2022. Cenevis is committed to supporting the communities where we live and work, said Minidosa Ethanol Plant Manager Avi Ball, helping fund a new fire truck and enhance fire training ground will improve emergency preparedness in Minidosa and other nearby towns and support our values around developing stronger, more resilient communities. Doreen Cole, Senior Vice President Downstream Manufacturing for Cenevis added, as a company, we have deep ties to this area and we completely understand the importance of supporting local institutions in, and fire departments. These institutions better prepare us to respond to challenges. The Minidosa Fire Department is an absolutely excellent example of that, and they work so hard to keep the community safe. The fire training grounds facility was designed for use year round and is equipped with rooms of varying sizes. These rooms can be adjusted to a variety of scenarios to keep them fresh. Other useful tools, such as an obstacle course capable of simulating cave-ins is also included in the facility. Fire Department Dean Jordan was on the scene along with fellow department, fellow fire department members for the announcement. On behalf of the department, Jordan expressed gratitude for Cenevis's partnership. He said, we're extremely thankful for Cenevis's investment in our department and the training grounds specifically. The facility is not only going to serve Minidosa, but the surrounding communities for generations. We have lots of plans for expansions in the future, and this is definitely a huge step. Mayor Ken Cameron added, it is a true honor when we can partner with companies such as Cenevis to bring training facilities and new equipment to our community, which helps our community grow and attract people. At present, it is anticipated that the fire training grounds are one month away from finalizing minor details and pursuing a grand opening. This facility is available for use by the whole of the mutual aid district. So here we have a picture of Avi Ball, Minidosa plant manager, Carrie Margetts, VP of Canadian Downstream Manufacturing and Technical Service, Doreen Cole, Senior Vice President of Canadian Downstream Manufacturing. Pre she presents a check to Dean Jordan, the fire chief. Here's Ken Cameron, the mayor, and James Jim Doppler, CAO of Minidosa. All right, let's move on. Art is for Everybody by Casper Wehrhahn. Nipois Arts Forward opened a fresh exhibit for the month of June last Thursday. Fitting well in conjunction with Filipino History Month, the exhibit features the mixed media works of artist Clement Villamere Jr. of Carberry. Villamere is also known through his artist name, Akozi Tengnamo. Villamere describes his primary mediums as a combination of stencil, brush strokes, and collages. Whether it's an acrylic or watercolor painting, a sculpture, or perhaps a mixture, Villamere's personal style and passion appears evident in each. I also use a lot of recycled materials, things that would likely just go to the dump. I've always liked using materials that people neglect. This recycling of materials can be seen within a variety of pieces featured at the June exhibit, including one made of a collage 
of spray paint cans. Huh. Another example uses a mixture of cardboard, sticks, and recycled metal to create a collection of stilted houses. Born in Angono Rizal, Philippines, Villamere got his start as an artist at a, an early age. I started really young, he said. My uncle, I used to hang out in his studio a lot. I always watched him work. He didn't teach me, but through watching him, I learned how he did the projects he worked on and built up my own skills. While I was in school, I did a national art competition and it was an amazing experience. Competitions help me to gain more experience and develop. It's part of how I learn. He halted his painting for a period of time while in college, going on to work as a cook for about 15 years. His life journey brought him to Singapore before moving to Canada, where he traveled. He continued to travel and returned to his passion. I was in British Columbia before going to Newfoundland, said Villamere, and I remember I painted for every province and left art there. Then I fell in love with the prairies. After Mil Villamere made his home in Carberry, he had the unique opportunity to teach art at the local school for a year. This experience is one he holds particularly fondly in his heart. One of my friends is a teacher there for grade five. He had asked me what I did in the Philippines and I said, art. And he said, he saw my work and said, wow, you should teach a class. After further discussion, Villamere agreed that he would teach art at the school if the idea was approved. And sure enough, Villamere went on to teach the students for a full year. I had never done that before and I was so touched. It was a unique experience. The kids were nervous because they weren't sure if their classmates would like their art. So I brought up art from people like Picasso. They started young too and art is for everybody and it's, a, it's subjective. Villamere added, teaching them how to dream. This teaching job was really special. We grew really close and the students still say hi to me if they see me. They all grew to be so passionate. Villamere's own dream is to one day have his own gallery. So here we have a picture of students touring um, Arts Forward on June the 18th for the opening of uh, Villamere's new exhibit. So these are just students looking at these uh, sculptures. Here we have a picture of uh, Villamere. He's carefully pointing out some materials used in his sculpture of a collection of houses as he describes the piece and how it was made. And here we have uh, among his works are some parodies of famous artist Bansky, including the one pictured here. This picture is um, made out of acrylic spray. So if you're around Arts Forward area, drop in and see his, his artwork. Here we some have some pictures of Kinsman Courts to host summer party. Oh my goodness. They held a, a summer party this past weekend. On June 11th, starting at 11 a.m., everyone was welcome to come down to the facility and enjoy a petting zoo. Huh. Um, a 50-50 draw was also held and was won by Jill Henderson. Later in the day, an ice cream truck was also available to serve up some cool treats. <laughs> so they set that up right outside Kinsman Chorus. How cool is that? All right, a slam in good time in in Nipua. Canadian Wrestling Elite hosts house show at Yellowhead Hall. Now there isn't really a, an article about this, but uh, there's some pictures. Wrestling fans in Nipua were ready to rumble on Wednesday, June 7th, as Canadian Wrestling Elite held a show at the Yellowhead Hall. It is a Winnipeg-based promotion founded in 2009 by Danny Dugan. 
the Canadian Wrestling Elite House Show featured five matches, including one featuring former WWE superstar, the masterpiece Chris Masters, now known as Chris Adonis, pictured here. Now, on to some sports articles. Titans Building for the Future by Owen Devereaux. The Nipah Titans have started to solidify their future both on and off the ice. The Junior A Hockey Club announced on Monday, June 12th, that 15-year-old forward Addison McIntosh has signed a letter of intent with the team. McIntosh spent last season with the Illaha Chiefs of the Manitoba 18 and under AAA league where he had 11 goals to go along with 12 assists in 44 games. Titans head coach and general manager Ken Pearson stated that Addison has worked hard for this and is committed to improve daily. His competitive age, edge and offensive, offensive upside is something we are excited about. We look forward to him having a great season and improving over the next year in Yellowhead before joining the Titans. McIntosh, who is from Nipua, said that he's very much looking forward to being a part of his hometown team. I am excited to sign my letter of intent with the team I grew up watching. Playing for the Titans has always been a goal of mine since I was a kid. Now to have a chance to play with them is a dream come true and I'm so proud to be a Titan, said McIntosh. And this is a picture of him right here. Other notable announcements from the Titans will impact how the team looks behind the bench and at practices. First, the club has come to terms with assistant coach Lannan Cameron to return for another year. Cameron is entering his second season with the club and is looking forward to working with the other members of the coaching staff and helping to improve the great group of returning players. Along with the return of Cameron, the Titans are adding to the staff. Devin Fordyce has agreed to terms on a contract as the new goaltenders coach. Last year, Fordyce was with the Yellowhead Chiefs 18 and under male AAA team as their goalie coach. His playing experience, meanwhile, includes stints in the WHL's Prince George Cougars, as well as the Alberta and Manitoba Junior Hockey Leagues. Nipua also added some employees who will spend most of their time in other arenas as opposed to the Yellowhead Centre with Chris Menard and Chad Taylor joining the organization's scouting staff. Menard will serve as the organization's Winnipeg area scout while Taylor will concentrate on the Manitoba 18 and under AAA Hockey League for the Titans. Taylor was also recently appointed as the head coach of the Yellowhead Chiefs 18 and under AAA Hockey Club. Boy, he's going to be a busy fella. Now here we have a picture of the Minidosa Mavericks. Welcome, welcome, they're being welcomed in the, into the Manitoba Baseball Hall of Fame. They are from the 2000 and, oh, the 2006 to 2015 Minidosa Mavericks were inducted into the Manitoba Baseball Hall of Fame. The banquet was held June 3rd in Morden. The team had a historic run in the Santa Clara Baseball League, winning 10 consecutive league championships. Boy, that's fantastic. And also on baseball, the Nipua Cubs gain no ground in Santa Clara League standings by Owen Devereaux. The Nipua Cubs split their most recent games in the Santa Clara Baseball League on Wednesday, June 7th. The Cubs defeated the Minidosa Mavericks 6-5. Taylor Fletcher went 2-3 for three at the plate and drove in a pair of RBIs for the Cubs while teammate Dustin Cook was 2-4 for four and had a pair of RBIs of his own. Pitcher Cole Krukwich registered the win going three innings and striking out eight. Two nights later in Austin, the Cubs were bested by a late game comeback from the A's, falling five to four. Despite a solid outing on the mound with six strikeouts, Shane Fraze was tagged with the loss for Nipua. 
Elsewhere around the league, the Plumas Pirates have remained perfect so far this season. They are now 6-0 after beating the Carberry Royals 10-0 on Friday, June 9th. Zach Yando had another big night at the plate with a home run, his fourth of the season. He also added a, a single, double, and three RBIs. Plumas pitcher Justin Walker collected the win with a five-inning performance. He struck out six Carberry batters and allowed just a pair of hits. So at this point, these are the standings in the Santa Clara Baseball League. In first place, Plumas Pirates. In second place, Portage. Third place, Austin. Fourth place, Carberry. Fifth place, Nipua. Sixth place, Minidosa. Alrighty. Now, the next article, Nature Conservancy Canada introduces multi-species conservation approach by Casper Werhan. Nature Conservancy Canada, also known as NCC, invited area residents to the Nipua Legion last week. The purpose of the invitation was to introduce attendees to the priority place conservation plan for the Southwest Manitoba region in which Nipua is included. This, this is the region right here. So here's Nipua right there. So this is very much southwestern. We're just on the edge. The Priority Places Initiative has a focus on species at risk. Species at risk is also SAR, but also includes other items such as biodiversity. A report by the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services from 2019 states that the rate of decline for species is at an unprecedented levels and that extinction rates are accelerating. This report was a contributing factor to NCC's development of a new plan. There was a need to do something to get a handle on this in Canada and around the world, said Stephen Anderson of NCC. It's a bit of an evolution, if you will, um, of previous species at risk programming. Anderson explained that previous SAR programming has been focused on single species in scattered areas. However, NCC found that this approach wasn't getting them where they wanted to be. So we got together at Canadian Wildlife Directors Committee meetings and discussed species recover, conservation and how to go from a single species to a multi-species approach. This broadens the scope to achieve that and preserve ecosystems in a more targeted and collaborative effort. Anderson added, really at the core of what we want to do here is to get better conservation outcomes and to achieve the co-benefits of biodiversity, ecosystem services, and human health and well-being. Priority places are established in partnership with each province and territory based on biodiversity values, conservation status slash risks, achievable conservation outcomes, opportunities for leadership and partnerships, and appropriate size of space to focus efforts. In the Southwest Manitoba Priority Place, Southwest MPP, a total of 47 federally listed and 33 provincially listed SAR. Some of these species are only, uh, some of these species only live within the SWMPP area. Additionally, the SWMPP has a focus on grassland ecosystems, which were determined to be at higher highest risk. These two factors go hand in hand as the species included are most dependent on mixed green and sand prairie habitats. 
75% of Canada's mixed grass prairie has been converted to annual crop production and other uses. That remaining 25%, they're under pressure and threat of continued cultivation, further fragmentation, shrub and tree encroachment, unsustainable gra grazing and invasive species. NCC hopes to expand its partnerships, particularly with First Nations, Métis, industry and agricultural organizations, watershed districts, and rural municipalities via priority places to combat the challenges present. At present, NCC hopes to have a finalized draft of the priority places plan in 2024. Those curious about the presentation and discussions are able to view a version of the program via NACTV. Now, here we have a picture, it's called the Glory Years, of a group of students from Preston School in 1944. They were taught by Edna Thompson. The photo was featured in the Gladstone's Glory Years booklet series. <laughs> All right, next, let's see couple of old pictures here that can be seen at the Beautiful Plains Museum. These are just a couple of scenes around Nipua. Pictured here um, are scenes from the past located at various places around Nipua. So this one is the Nipua elevator located at the CPR North End as it appeared around 1890. The individuals pi pictured here uh, were not identified. And of course, this is no longer there. And here we have a view of Hamilton Street um, in Nipua from an unspecified year. However, the cars that can be seen here <laughs> appear to be from the late 1940s. This photo was, a reprinted, was reprinted for use as a postcard, huh. Some of our town still looks like that. Now, the Nipua Middle School also had a breakfast outdoors. Students here were eagerly enjoying a fresh breakfast on the morning of June the 14th. Teachers <laughs> whipped up some fresh, warm French toast right here as an assortment of tasty sliced fruit was also handed out. Many students sat at the available picnic tables while others chose a comfy spot on the newly completed play structure to enjoy their meals. <laughs> now here's a picture of the renovations to Nipois old RCMP building. The renovations of the former RCP building in Nipua is starting to take shape. Cutting Edge Construction, a company based out of Brandon, has begun the renovation and expansion of the facility. The structure of the old RCP building is being altered in order to accommodate the new $2.1 million nursing program that was first announced back in February. The cost of this renovation covers Nipua's financial commitment to the project. Assiniboine Community College is operating the one-time 25-student practical nursing diploma program that will be coming to Nipua in 2024. Very good. The Swedes Invade Ericsson, submitted by Swedish Cultural Association. Swedes from Manitoba, Ontario, Alberta and British Columbia, the United States and Australia came to join Swedes in Ericsson to celebrate their rich Swedish culture and heritage. Ericsson was one of the first settlements of Swedes in Manitoba. The Swedish Cultural Association of Manitoba wanted to meet the people and pay tribute to the ancestors who made it all happen. Swedish accordion music and a warm, was a warm welcome that had toast dancing and heart singing. 
coffee was on, stories were told, and displays showed slices of the history of Swedish settlement in the area. Traditional Swedish food for lunch energized the crowd. Willing hands completed the maypole that was paraded to Viking Ship Park. The parade was led by Carol Gunvaldson on the Nickel Harpa and included the Scandia folk dancers, the Maypole, the Gustav, and Gustav the Dalla horse, um, all the way from Vaza land in Winnipeg. Once the willing Vikings got the Maypole in place, Swedish ring dancing had young and old joining in the fun dances followed by Scandia fun folk dancers with special Swedish dancers preparing especially for the event. Tours of the Scandinavian cemeteries with lemonade at the Scandinavian Immigration House 1885 Cairn brought out more interesting and entertaining stories. It was a glorious Ericsson day that will fill us with rich memories forever. Here's just a few pictures of, uh, they're in the uh, Viking boat here, and here's Gust of the, the horse. Hmm. Okay, we'll go back and read a few other air articles. Homebodies by Rita Friesen. This week it's entitled Haying Weather. As we were sitting at the chef, lingering, oh, I guess that's the chicken chef restaurant, lingering over a cup of coffee, a gentleman stopped by to visit. This was just days after the heat wave, and so weather and temperature was one of the topics. His comment was, haying weather, this with a knowing shoulder shrug. And then he asked how I could write so much about nothing, not his exact words. And I asked for topic suggestions. Being of an age older than I, but with similar backgrounds, he tried a Schultz from Hogan's Heroes. I see nothing. I hear nothing. I know nothing. We all know that Walter knows a great deal about a great many topics. And so the subject returned to haying. Back in the day with the sweep making windrows and a cross raking to form piles of hay that were gathered, stamped down, on the hay racks to be unloaded at home in well-formed stacks for winter feed. He spoke about the sweat running down your back and burning in your eyes as you struggled to lift the hay you were standing on to toss it down. Yep, and all I had to compare that with was the small, square, really rectangular bales of my youth. The story isn't much different if it occurs on a hot, swelterly summer day. I mentioned the slings that swung the hay into the loft of the hip-roofed barn. That was for rich people. Okay, both my grandparents had big barns with hay slings, and that was my normal. It took maturity on my part well into adulthood before I recognized that both sets of my grandparents were hard-working, progressive, and prosperous farmers. Big barns, a drive through granary, a wind charger in the front yard. It's what we had, and I never thought to check out what other neighbors had or didn't have. They were neighbors. The con conversation somehow shifted to cleaning out pens. I maintain one of the worst to clean is a sheep pen. Their tiny hooves pack that manure so tightly that the best method of sheep pen cleaning is to turn the hogs into there for a few days. Walter thought that was genius. I confess that I am last conserving energy and time, not necessarily brilliant. He parried with stories of cleaning pens when young calves had been held. Their little feet do much the same packing job as sheep. He explained that when you tried to lift the loaded pitchfork, Lots, long strings of linked hay and straw made the task frustrating. That too. Our chatting continued until his wife came back for him. <laughs> and as he was leaving, he mentioned again that he 
knew nothing, but I should keep on writing. I assured him he had just written this week's column for me. I do enjoy formulating my thoughts and sharing them with you. I appreciate feedback, and I am finding that many of you appreciate being walked back through the good old days. At least, they look good from here now. <laughs> For folks often wonder how I can always find something to write about, and I remind them that when I stop talking, close the box. <laughs> oh, dear. All right. Uh, right in the Center by Ken Waddell. This week it's entitled Thoughts, Lots of Thoughts. Disclaimer, the views expressed in this column are the writer's personal views and are not to be taken as being the view of the banner and press staff. Sometimes columns come to mind based around one theme. Sometimes, like this week, many thoughts come to mind. The first one is that a person can think or believe whatever we want but with one exception. That exception is, we can't make someone else believe or think what we want. That said, what we want or think should be expressed openly and gently. There's a lot of non-gentle stuff going on these days, so gentle and informed discussion is very important. Here's some of my thoughts and ideas, and maybe they will encourage people to more openly say what they think or want. In no particular order, here goes. Ooh. Sexual activity should not be a spectator sport, be it publicly or by way of movies or videos. Sexual activity is ideally conducted between a man and a woman in a long-term committed relationship. Marketing, the movie and television industry are way too far down the sexualized path. It doesn't seem to matter what is being sold. It has to be accompanied by some sort form of sexual display. On a less serious note, perhaps how many tons of perfume is being poured into air fresheners and laundry detergents these days. Until seeing ads on TV the last few years, I would not have known there was a need to dreamily smell the fresh bath towels. According to the commercials, I am way off base, I guess. Electric cars are still heavily subsidized, and so are the new battery plants. Looks like the governments of Ontario and Canada are going to toss $20 billion of our money into battery plants in Ontario. That's an obscene amount of money per created job. Fair comment, though. The oil and gas industry is subsidized, too. Companies and sports teams are slow learners. Recent events have shown they need to stay out of political movements or their customers will simply fade away. When a company or a sports team advocates for a movement, they will fall victim to those who simply want athletes to be athletes and beer companies to be beer companies. When fans or customers leave, it's simply a kind of quiet quitting. People don't have to drink a certain beer or watch a certain team. People have choices and tend to exercise that choice. Sales and profits are important. That said, money isn't everything. If money or profits were everything, then this paper would have a drugs and prostitution <laughs> division with a side hustle selling illegal guns. My overall mantra is, it's, if it's illegal or immoral, don't do it. Illegality is set by the laws of the land and immorality by various standards. Both can be subject to change. The Ten Commandments seem to be a popular basic choice, at least by Christians, Jews, and Muslims. My father gave me some wise advice. He used to say, if it's not yours, don't touch it. That advice has a wide application. If a possession or property isn't yours, then don't touch it. If a person isn't your spouse, then don't touch them. Too simple for some, but I think it's great advice. As always is, if you agree with me, that's fine. If not, that's fine too. Either way, send us your opinions, and if you want me to read them, I will happily do so. If you want me to publish them, I will certainly consider that too. All right, the last article today is by Faithfully Yours by Neil Strosheim. 
Dreams Worth Working and Praying for Part 2. A few weeks ago, I saw an interesting post on Instagram. It was a picture of a group of elementary school students tending a vegetable garden. They were learning how some of the fruit and vegetables they ate each week are grown. From the looks on their faces, I could tell how much they enjoyed this section of their science course. The caption below the picture read, Should upper elementary and junior high school students be taught how to grow their own food? My answer is a resounding yes, but I think we can add several other items to the list of things students should be taught. In a January 2021 article I found somewhere, uh, the author was Matthew Schwartz, he suggested that all high school curricula should include a basic life skills program that covers accounting and money management, career paths and networking, nutrition and mental health, computer science, and work ethic. Hmm. To these, I would add topics like basic vehicle maintenance, how to make simple home repairs, things like changing a light bulb or patching a hole in the wall, plunging a plug toilet or removing stains from walls, carpets or clothing, and how to do minor repairs to one's clothing, like sewing on a button, darning socks, stitching together a split seam on a pair of pants, etc. No high school student should be allowed to graduate until he or she has learned that. Learn that if you break something, try to fix it before you replace it. Lessons like these will enable those who complete them to be more self-sufficient and as a result, less dependent on government to meet daily needs. Many years ago, I heard someone say that in this person's opinion, the average family in North America is one pay check away from bankruptcy. I was quite certain that very few people believed that statement when it was first uttered, but my, how things have changed. Between COVID, inflation, the war in Ukraine, and food shortages due to frost, flood, or dry weather, some families are discovering that their take-home pay no longer covers their costs for food, clothing, shelter, and transportation. So what does one do? Some appeal to government for additional help, but no government can look after its citizens from birth to death. Eventually, we must take responsibility for ourselves, working at a job, making money, and paying as we need, as we go for the things we need. And if we have learned some of the basic life skills identified above, we will find coping with difficult times to be somewhat easier. We will be able to keep track of our finances and economize where we can. By doing simple repairs ourselves, we will avoid the cost of hiring professionals to do them for us. And we will learn to live more simply until the crisis times have passed, thus surviving without government help. That's how people survived during the Great Depression of the 1930s and the war years that followed. <clears throat> it has been said that those who lived through those years were made of tougher stuff than we are. I re respectfully disagree. The truth is that we won't know how tough we are until we have to live through hard times similar to those our ancestors endured. That's why I believe we need to teach our children how to be more self-sufficient and less dependent on government. It may take a while to achieve this goal, but I believe it is a dream worth working and praying for. Now we have just a few minutes left, so I'm just going to read a little bit from uh, Days Gone By called Looking Back. There's just, there's not very much here, but I'll, I'll read. It's kind of interesting at times because it's from so long ago. 125 years ago in Nipois, June 1898, measles of a severe type developed among the Galatian colonists recently settled near the Huns Valley, which we talked about early and it is now known as Polonia. Several deaths have occurred last week 
Alarm at once spread throughout the neighborhood and the community authorities requested the immigration commissioner at Winnipeg to come to the rescue. 100 years ago, June 15, 1923, in Franklin, in the town of Franklin, rumor has it that Dr. W.E.R. Code, C-O-A-D, at one time a doctor with a local practice having passed examinations in England of a very advanced standard has sailed for Canada. Whether or not the doctor will locate here is not understood. The fact remains a doctor is needed here and needed badly. <laughs> 75 years ago, June 1948, in Wellwood, our sympathies to Mrs. A. Lord, who received word last week that her brother died in Australia. 50 years ago, June of 1973, Kenneth B. Morrison, editor and publisher of the Gladstone Age Press, announced this week that he will be running as an independent candidate in Gladstone constituency for the forthcoming election. And lastly, 20 years ago, June 2003, Rothsay Rendering will no longer be picking up animal carcasses free of charge. The plant stopped processing cattle carcasses following the discovery of mad cow disease in an Alberta cow. Before the discovery, Rothsay ha hauled away cattle byproducts for free from a number of Manitoba communities, including Nipawa. So that is it for this week's edition of the Nipwa Banner and Press. Thank you for joining us. Hopefully we'll see you another time. So bye for now.